These are four species of millipedes crawling across your screen in slow motion. You can tell they're millipedes and not centipedes because each of their many body segments has two pairs of legs instead of just one. They're some of the most important organisms in the forest, feeding on and recycling dead plant material. And honestly, I didn't know much about them. But luckily, a few weeks ago, a friend of mine, Derek, a millipede expert, visited this museum. You might have already heard of him and his work. Part of his research involves describing and discovering unnamed species. The one he's holding here in that vial is an Anaria swifty, probably the first millipede to be featured in a Rolling Stone article, which happened after he described and named the species after Taylor Swift. So one of the reasons Derek visited this museum is because our collection of millipedes and centipedes is one of the most important in the world. But before I get to that, I wanted to learn how a millipede expert goes out and finds these organisms. So I followed Derek into the field when we went out and collected those four species you saw at the beginning of this video. Yeah, so the main tool that I use is this garden cultivator, nice three prongs. It just allows you to turn over rocks and logs and leaf litter and so you don't have to use your hands and then get poked by whatever's hiding around down there. So when you're scraping litter, you want to just scrape down to the soil and then stop and wait for any movement. So that's often the first sign that you're going to see of a millipede or a centipede. You can see once we get down underneath that dry layer leaves on top, we got more moisture. So that's where all the bugs are. That's where millipedes and whatever other insects and spiders and things, that's where they're going to be hiding. Oh, here we go. Cambala. Cambala annulata. These are just gorgeous. It's the violet crested millipede. So it's got this nice deep purple collar. And then on top of each segment and around the sides as well, it has these tiny little linear crests. If you look real close, right at the shoulders, it kind of has these little orbs that the crests turn into. Just gorgeous, those white legs. And this millipede is the host for a type of fungus. And there's a new species that was discovered on one of these millipedes and they named it after Twitter because they first saw it on a photo that I tweeted out. I looked at this photo multiple times, I hadn't really seen much in it, and then a specialist in this group of fungus had seen these tiny little fungal bodies kind of off of its head and kind of the first column behind the head. And just from that she recognized that it was a fungus and likely a new species. So she checked some of the specimens in her collection that had been collected in North America, found that same fungus. And so it all just came out of uh, one Twitter photo. Here's a lot of juvenile millipedes. These are going to be more of that Eurus. So they're feeding down under the bark inside the log. There's an adult Eurus. He just went back in that hole there. Here, I can get him to come out. There he is. Come on. There we go. One of the log lurkers. If you see along the edge of their body, their segments are kind of winged. They have those keels. We call those paranoda. And they use that to wedge themselves into the log. So that kind of helps them move. But you can see it's pretty darn good at walking around right now. So right in the crook of this log, there's an adult cherry millipede. And there we go. Beautiful, it's got its full dark black coloration with its warning yellows screaming, hey, I'm poisonous. Just gorgeous. So this is Aphloria tigana. It's another one of the uh, Aphloriine cherry millipedes. It's closely related to the Virginia cherry millipede. Around this body size, uh, it's actually been calculated that they have enough um, poison within them to kill 18 pigeon-sized birds. So if you and your group of 17 other pigeons are thinking about having a meal, you might want to skip the cherry millipedes. Also, humans shouldn't eat these. You'll probably be fine. Maybe you'll throw up or something, but they don't taste good. You know, they belong in the leaves, not in your stomach. The iron worm has made an appearance. There's a couple of species further south in Florida and Georgia. There's also at least two species 
throughout much of the, um, oh, it's pooping on me, oh, <laughs> throughout most of, much of Eastern North America, but it's a species complex. It needs to be looked at genetically to figure it out. So you can see as it walks, it has this really nice leg action where they move just in a wave. And what helps it do that is that within each body ring, it has a tiny little ganglion, this little brain that processes the signal and tells the legs to move. And so it goes from the main brain in the head, cascades down the body to move those legs. So millipedes like these are special to this museum because our collection of them is world famous among experts like Derek. Many species were first described here and are housed in our offsite collection space. I went there with Derek because I wanted to see what it was like for someone to get really excited about jars of pickled millipedes. I wasn't disappointed. Oh, that's an exciting jar. Oh, these are neat. Oh, this is really cool actually. Oh, these are beautiful millipedes. This is like encountering an old friend again. This is a cool one. This is a classic. These ones really excite me. Oh, man, look at all these. These are cool. This is a fun jar. This whole collection here, you know, just these shelves that we're looking at right now, this is one of the most important uh, millipede collections really worldwide and in North America. Um, these collections were worked on for decades by Roland Shelley. He spent decades of work putting names to species that we just didn't know about before. It's just that it's like, you know, opening any one of these jars is kind of like Christmas morning, you know. You don't know what presents could be in here, what gifts are contained. You know, some of these larger, like the American millipede, that giant centipede we saw up there, that's, that's really cool to show on camera. But man, I really get excited about this small stuff that people just have probably not looked at before. And they're just treasures hidden within all of these jars and vials that, um, you know, we just even haven't even gotten to yet. <laughs> when I come into a collection like this, and I just see this huge jar of specimens. You know, it looks, maybe it looks a little bit gross because it's kind of yellowed. But once you actually get into each of these vials and look at them, um, there's just a lot of not only biological and natural history information held within these vials, but historical information as well. These will be looked at by scientists today and, you know, decades into the future, maybe even hundreds of years. And they play a very important role in that these, all these specimens are tied to a specific place and time. And so when we're thinking about um, things like threats to habitat and climate change, um, these form the foundation of data to where we can know, you know, 20 years ago, where did these species occur? And then we can go back today or 20 years in the future, see if they're still there and uh, learn why not. And so that's very important to have. Those few shelves of jars are just a tiny part of all the biological collections this museum holds. I was glad to learn about them and millipedes in general from an expert like Derek. I hope you learned something too. Thanks for watching.